This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the RTD Accountability Committee Operations Subcommittee meeting. Today is January 20th and it is Inauguration Day. So thank you all for joining us on what is a very momentous day. Um, I will briefly go through our agenda. As you all will see, we have a pretty packed um, conversation ahead of us. So uh, we'll begin by just briefly opening it up if folks from the committee have any questions or comments around the um, January 6th meeting summary. We'll give you all an opportunity to provide that. Um, it will move into discussion items, um, RTD briefing on administrative costs. So we have a special presenter, Doug McLeod with um, RTD, their CFO. Um, the number I, item number five, discussion on RTD transit service levels, that is actually a typo from the previous meeting. So that will not be part of this agenda. Um, is that correct, Matthew? I just want to confirm. Yes, okay. Um, then we'll move into the bulk of our conversation, um, which is around uh, fixed route service delivery. And I'll provide a little bit of context um, around that, that discussion. So um, welcome members of the committee. I wanna just open it up. If there are questions, comments, um, or edits related to the January 6th meeting summary that we need to make edits to, please feel free to share those now. Matthew, I did want to point out just briefly, as I'm looking at the agenda, I do see some typos of 2020 still reflected and it should be 2021. So I think if we could just make those edits um, in the final documents, that would be great. All right, hearing no comments, I'm gonna go ahead and move us into the discussion items and we'll start with the RTD briefing on administrative costs of fare collection. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Doug. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. I am going to try to share my screen. Let's see how this goes. All right. Um, can you see a document that says Regional Transportation District Cost of Collecting Fares? We can. Can you make it just a little bit larger? Absolutely. There we go. Is that okay? Okay. <clears throat> okay, great. So um, what I attempted to do here was um, uh, show that we have individual groups that actually are involved in collecting RTD's fares. Um, so I've combined those costs, I've kind of compared 2020 to 2019. 2019 was the last year where we actually had a normal year with fare collection. So I wanted to show you um, both the normal year and what we're currently seeing in uh, 20 or what we saw in 2020 during the, the pandemic. Um, but I put comments out here to the right uh, describing what each of these groups do. Um, we have treasury, treasury management that oversees the whole treasury function. And we talk, when we talk about treasury, they're really responsible for the, the collection of fares. Um, we do have some ancillary um, duties that are outside of treasury that have to do with um, fair fulfillment, um, contracting, that kind of thing, but it really, it's really the treasury group that collects fares for RTD. Um, within the treasury group, in addition to the management oversight, we also have the revenue equipment group. Uh, there are about 25 individuals that make up this group. Um, there are three supervisors, the rest of them are uh, represented technicians. Their primary job is to maintain the fair equipment, including uh, the the fare collection boxes on all 100, 1,075 buses that we have. We have about 200 ticket vending machines for the rail lines. Um, we have three pass vending machines in our um, in Denver Union Station and elsewhere. Um, and then they, we also have what we call uh, retail point of sale for our smart cards. <clears throat> so, so where you a customer can go to Safeway or King Supers and get a smart card. We have um, units there called RPOS retail points of sale where those cards are activated. So that group is in charge of maintaining all of that equipment. Um, in addition to our our, uh, our paper punch um, validators that are on our rail lines. And then finally, um, we have oh we have Treasury. Sorry, this Treasury description is our counting room. So they handle all the cash that comes in from the fare box and the ticket vending machines. It's a very secure facility. Um, all the employees have to wear smocks with no pockets. We have cameras everywhere, but they basically um, collect the money, sort it, uh, put it through the counting machines and then prepare it for deposit. 
And then finally, we have the accounts receivable group. Um, we have them separate from Treasury because they are in charge of media for fulfillment. They send out the fair media. When I talk about fair media, I'm talking about our smart cards, um, anything physical that we use for our, our fares, uh, paper tickets. Um, and they also do all of the billing. So we have that separate from Treasury because Treasury actually keeps the inventory of the fair media. So uh, just quickly, um, total cost of collections in 2019 for these groups, that all their uh, salaries and wages and any ancillary costs they have for equipment um, and supplies was $5 million, $4.5 million in 2020. And then what I tried to do is try to put that in context by breaking it down on a per unit basis and also comparing it to our fair revenue. So in 2020, 2019, we collected $154 million in fair revenue. The percentage of the costs, the percentage of costs relative to that fair revenue is 3.3%. 2020 is 5.7 percent because our fair revenue dropped so significantly it's almost half in 2020 of what it was in uh, 2019. And then I compared it on a per ridership basis so I broke down our fair revenue per rider. Um, so in 2019 we had 95 million riders with fair collections of 154 million. That's average um, revenue per rider to RTD of $1.62. On the same per rider basis, the cost of collections is five cents. So net cost after cost of collections is $1.57 in 2019, $1.52 in 2020. And so I know I only had five minutes, so I'll leave the rest of the time for questions. Thank you so much, Doug. I will open up to the committee to see if you all have any questions, comments. Elise. Thanks so much for that presentation. Very helpful. Um, I'm curious how this compares to other transit agencies, the, the ratios in terms of, um, you know, cost of collection per rider and as a percentage of the total fare revenue. Yeah, and I, I could ask a couple of, of other agencies for that information. Um, when I've looked at their websites, they don't give us that kind of breakdown of their costs down to the actual cost of the folks that do the collections. But I could try to see if there's some information available that I could get. Um, if it's if, if it's something that's that's doable, I, I don't want to burden you all with a whole lot. I'm just curious whether or not your sense is that this is pretty standard for the business. Or is RTD better or worse at it? Any sense of that, just in general? I think just looking at our operations, we operate pretty efficiently. Um, we we have a very small number of people um, performing maintenance on all the, this equipment. Um, same with our counting room. We actually um, we have periods uh, where we get, tend to get more fair revenue than others. So we actually have part timers that we bring in rather than hiring full-timers that um, want to be busy all the time. Um, so at least from my perspective, I think we operate pretty efficiently um, in collecting these fares. You know, one of the things we've seen over the years is um, we've seen a, a fairly large shift in purchasing fares over to credit cards and debit cards. In fact, our ticket vending machines back in 2013 and prior, we only, collect, we only allowed uh, cash purchases through those ticket vending machines. We uh, made them um, compatible with uh, debit and credit cards, and we've seen a shift to 80% credit and less cash. So, you know, as the years have gone by, we've actually reduced our staff. Um, some of that's through attrition. Um, in the event that we had uh, stopped collecting billing or stopped collecting fares from April through June of uh, 2020, we repurposed those uh, collection technicians over to help clean vehicles. So we try to be as cost conscious as possible over there, but I can try to find out what uh, other agencies experience. Madam Chair? Yes, Matthew. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Cog's staff can take a look and, and see what we can find at, at peer agencies. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? 
I guess I, I do have a question, Doug, and I don't know that this would even be feasible, but I'm just curious um, if you all have broken out the cost for fair collection by fair media. And I guess to give you a sense of kind of what I'm thinking, one thing that we've heard is that the administrative cost of the low income, the affordable fair, that live program is very high in comparison potentially to other um, fair media that's offered by RTD. Have you all done that level of analysis on what the cost is by fair media? That's a great question. No, we have not. We are able to capture some of those costs individually. So in the instance of the, the LIVE program, the majority of those costs are actually um, incurred by Denver Human Services. Uh, they, Because we're not experts in, in the transit in, industry um, in providing social services, uh, we've contracted with Denver Human Services to um, administer that program for the most part. We have a website where you can sign up that they helped us um, develop. Uh, they maintain that website through the PEAK system where um, where people can go for assistance in addition to the LIVE program. Um, so we've really contracted a lot of those services out. And I would say the same thing about some of our other popular fair media, such as our uh, mobile ticketing. We actually contract that out to a company called Masabi in which case they um, charge us a, a, a fee. Um, it's relatively low. It's, um, I believe it's 2% um, to use their website and for them to administer the fares for us um, and have this uh, software for um, mobile devices to purchase tickets with. So we could probably gather that to a certain extent. It would be hard to break it down uh, to all of the fair media that we have just because we have passes, we have um, other paper tickets that are sent out um, by our folks in accounts receivable and elsewhere. So it would be hard to break it down on a per media basis, probably. I'm going to um, ask a question that's in the chats. Do collection costs factor in the increased dwell times at stops for fair collection, which slows down boarding and increases run times and thus operating costs? Um, I have not captured that in this instance here. I was just trying to capture the kind of the, the back end costs of um, actually collecting those fares. So certainly there would be some other um, costs and I think that would be hard to capture too, um, to measure how long it takes a person to <laughs> submit their fares. We have tried to speed up that process because we understand it, it does um, uh, increase dwell times. In fact, um, we're looking at an account-based fare system that we're going out to bid for um, that we'd like to replace the majority of our fares with this new system. And one of the big considerations there was where to place validators because we didn't want to um, slow or add to any dwell times or cause any customer inconvenience. So that had to do with the placement as well as the number of validators. So we try to minimize that as much as possible. I'm not sure how we could capture accurately the cost of that. Thank you. Could I ask um, a follow-up on that? Yes, go for it, Lisa. Just do you capture the time associated with um, how long, uh, how long, uh, what the dwell time is um, for different uh, vehicles and, and media types? We would know what the dwell time is based on our APCs because they have um, what we call uh, CAD ABL, Commuter Aided Dispatch Automatic Vehicle Locators. So we know how long a vehicle um, is at a particular point. Um, we just don't capture what's causing that. You know, it could be because a customer is running to the bus and our, our, um, our bus driver stops. I believe um, generally with operations, those bus drivers, they don't sit there and necessarily wait for the customer to put their fare in. If they were getting their fares out, they probably take off. They're very concerned with um, being meeting their on-time performance. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Doug, um, for joining us and thank you for providing that overview. I want to make sure that we have this in our report. So if it's not um, if it wasn't presented or shared prior to the convene or prior to this meeting, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with uh, Matthew and the Dr. Cobb team. Absolutely, yes, uh, we did Madam, share it with. You. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, Madam Chair, uh, Doug already sent it over, and we're going to send it out after the meeting. Okay, great, thank you. All right.
Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, I think that's great context to lead into the next portion of the conversation. Um, so kind of taking the, the, the last meeting that we had on the 6th and um, the desire by this committee to really start to dive into the relationship between fares um, and ultimately service delivery and the relationship between um, both of these in terms of operations. Um, I want to go ahead and, and shift the conversation and open it up uh, for us to hear from folks in the disability community and their perspective um, in using the RTD fixed route service. So I have requested um, that Jamie Lewis with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition join us. Um, we're going to turn it over to Jamie for about 15, 20 minutes or so, um, have a little bit of Q&A in that conversation as well before we shift to learning about um, the business perspective on RTD fixed route service delivery. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Jamie. Hopefully you can hear us. I see that you are off mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm having trouble with the volume on this side hearing you guys, but I uh, just wanted to make sure you could hear me. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for having me. Um, Dea had asked me about two weeks ago to uh, highlight any issues that uh, the disability community currently has or opportunities. Um, so I picked the top five. I want to make it clear there's, there's probably more, but to have a manageable conversation, I figure I'd keep it down to five. Um, so um, I think Matthew had sent you uh, my email last night to kind of prep you on what we're going to talk today. That way you could have some prepared questions. Um, but I just want to let you know that, you know, the CCDC's had a long history uh, with RTD, <clears throat> both positive and negative. Uh, through communications, we've been able to change policy, operating procedures to help make uh, transportation better for people with disabilities. Unfortunately, there's been uh, times where we haven't already uh, met eye to eye, so we've had to do settlement agreements, which is a little expensive for RTD. And uh, we wish we could avoid those, but uh, when uh, we have to fight for our people, we'll do anything we have to do. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention to you is the first one is zero scape entrance for the light rail. <clears throat> this may not be on people's radar right now, but um, RTD recently decided to open up the uh, high block, which is the entrance for the first train, to basically anyone. Uh, the reason for that high block was to ensure that people with disabilities had access to the train. Uh, we feel, and I forgot to mention that I'm also the chair of the ACPD, which is the Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities. Uh, so this causes a problem. Um, uh, we do not want to be pitted against people uh, who have baby carriages or the homeless who need to use the ramp or people who have luggage. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't sacrifice <clears throat> the main purpose of that ramp is to provide people with disabilities a chance to get on the train and to enjoy transit. Um, so one of the issues that's come up is zero scape entrance for the uh, for uh, light rail. Uh, I think you've all have been on the A line <clears throat> to the airport and realize how beautiful it is just to walk from a platform right into a train uh, without having to climb steps. So that's something I think RTD needs to research, look at, and uh, plan for. Because unfortunately, if there's no planning, if there are dollars that come down from the federal level, hopefully in 2021, 2022, uh, if we don't have anything in place uh, to uh, fill that gap, that problem that we're identifying, then uh, you can't use that money. Um, the second issue is wayfinding. Um, we find that the transit stations are woefully inadequate as far as wayfinding. This is for our blind community. Uh, I, I can't imagine getting off a of, uh, I-25 I and Broadway station and just getting off the train and not knowing which direction to go. So what we're asking is more wayfinding signs. Uh, this can include audio. Uh, it could include uh, directional um, pavement. Uh, this is a new technology that's been used in mostly Europe and some parts of America, where it's a vertical. It's about three or four inches wide. It's a it's it's basically grouted cement that kind of gives a person with a white walking stick an opportunity to to follow a direction. 
Um, so those are things that we're hoping to see improvements so our blind community can navigate around uh, transit stations. Um, the next two are actually opportunities, as far as I'm concerned, is multimodal transportation. Um, uh, some of you are aware that Denver is uh, renegotiating a scooter electric bike uh, contract. And in that contract, we've made sure that there are multimodal type of vehicles, uh, not vehicles, but bikes. Uh, for instance, a four-wheel bike. So somebody who has a mobility issue can use a bike. Um, so we're hoping to, that uh, RTD becomes a little more aggressive as far as making space for those uh, those items at uh, transit stations. Um, so when a person gets off a train they, or a bus, they can go right to another uh, mo uh, type of transportation to get the last mile. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I've got a light cough today, so I, please forgive me. Uh, the other one is um, on-demand services. Um, this, when we talk about Uber, Lyft, taxi, uh, we really need to make space for them at transit stations. Uh, again, providing that last mile connection for people is so important. Um, obviously, people like Douglas and I wouldn't be able to enjoy that because we're in wheelchairs, Kristen also. But we have other part of, uh, community members in the disability community that could use Uber and Lyft to make that last uh, mile connection. So having a reserve spot for them or a queue spot for them at a transit station would actually enhance that. Um, the last one is bus stops. And uh, for some of us that have been around for a while, know this has been an ongoing problem. Uh, putting bus stops where it's just totally inaccessible. Uh, either there's no platform, um, it's put on dirt, grass, or it's put on a block where there's no way of egressing. There, for instance, you might be on a block that has no curb cuts, or you might be on a block that, you know, I hate to say trip to nowhere. Um, the, the unfortunate thing, or I said the shameful thing about that, there's been several studies, and there's a lot of information that RTD has collected over the years, but never really has acted upon it. Um, so I really think that uh, that is one of uh, the, the disability's biggest uh, disappoint our community was one of the biggest disappointments is how bus stops are placed and how they're uh, not maintained. So uh, those are my five. And again, it's not comprehensive. There are other issues, but when I was asked two weeks ago, uh, these were the things that were on my radar. So I'd love to answer any questions for you. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. Um, and I will go ahead and open it up to questions, comments from the committee, anything else that you all would like to maybe dive a little bit deeper into with Jamie while we have um, while we have him with us. Hey, yeah. This yes. is Kevin Audio. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you for the presentation um, and for the notes. It was really helpful to kind of follow along. I, I have a couple thoughts and just follow up questions on on the recommendations. The first one is about zero scaping the entrances. Um, is, I guess, can you elaborate on what that, that concept is a little bit more? Um, my, my familiarity for city council on, on zero scaping is uh, water wise, um, low water impact, um, landscaping, natural plants, that kind of thing. So I guess I'm, I'm having a trouble kind of understanding the concept on, on this side. Could you, let's start with that. And then I do have another uh, follow up question. Sure, it's just an expression that I, I picked zero scape because it's uh, there's no uh, steps. Um, right now, uh, in order to get onto the light rail, you have to climb three very steep steps. Okay. Um, if you were to get on the A line, it's an equal, it's a very level entrance. Uh, you go from right from the platform right into the train without having to go up steps. Uh, that provides people with disabilities, especially people like myself in a wheelchair, I can get on any of those trains. I don't have to go to the first train. And it, it uh, distributes the uh, the passenger load a lot more evenly. Um, so I apologize for the zero scape reference. I just, <laughs> when I think of zero scape, I think of no step. So that's why okay. I use that terminology and we can change that if we need to. No problem. I just was getting confused just on my end, um, just having a different definition. So that's helpful. Just no steps, because uh, uh, a uniform, uh platform i guess 
Um, and as I had mentioned, it's not just for the, the, the disability community, it's also for the general community. I think it's much safer and it actually loads and unloads the train much faster. Okay, thank you for that um, additional comment. Um, and the other, the other part is um, on the bus stop. Um, and maybe this isn't necessarily directed to you. Um, this is just more of like a, a thought on the um, bus stop standards. I agree that we should have some uniformity. I, I see some bus stops um, in my district that you know you you kind of miss them because they're a little inconspicuous. There's no, I guess, physical designation minus the the little red you know marker on on like a pole and um, you know, when I think about lack of sidewalks or curb cuts, I, I, my mind goes to kind of the conversation around just like older infrastructure and kind of the, you know, the, the lack of reinvestment in um, kind of the urban core of a city. Um, I think that would typify um, what we experienced in, in the Ward 1 district in Aurora, we have the Colfax part, right? So the older part of the the the, the city and then people start to develop outward. And so the, the standards were not the same um, to build sidewalks in neighborhoods and in along the streets and development has since kind of progressed. So in, when it comes to at least the Colfax, um, I know we have explored the idea of bus rapid transit and and some of the challenges that we have is that, you know, it's kind of hard. We can't really expand it all that much because the, that part is pretty densely developed compared to other areas. So, you know, I, I agree with having standards. Um, I guess that that's one thought. The other is, uh, you know, we, it is the, when, when we talk to our constituents about code enforcement and, and maintaining a sidewalk, that is the responsibility of the owners. And so, you know, and but often owners aren't financially able to, you know, pay for sidewalk um, fixes or or you know with increases to kind of keep up with ADA compliance now that that's evolved. So you know, the some nexus. If if we go move forward with this recommendation, I'd love to have a some sort of tie with how do we finance that because I I doubt that you know in a low income neighborhood maybe that's older with smaller sidewalks that needs kind of some of those upgrades, not just for bus stop standards, but to meet like the, the widening sidewalk kind of compliance that residents would be able to, you know, put that out of pocket. So I'd love to explore at some point the, the finance piece on that. And, and I agree with this. Is, this is, has like multi levels to it as far as enforcement. Um, you know, I agree that RTD cannot <clears throat> get into the business of managing the property around uh, the bus stop. Uh, but the standards would help. It's kind of like the carrot and the stick. You know, if a community wants a bus stop, and then they're going to have to provide a place that is accessible. That's where the standards come in. As far as trying to fix existing uh, bus stops, there definitely has to be a collaboration between RTD and the municipality to either enforce the rules that are already on the books or to come up with some multi-funding uh, to address those issues. So I totally agree with you. This is not an easy task, but there's plenty of, uh, of data out there identifying the ones that do that are problematic. And uh, I just don't see any push by RTD to fix it. So I think that's the, the major concern that we have from uh, the disability community. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Councilwoman Murillo. I, I wanna just lift up the last point that was made by Jamie and really make the connection between the work not only of this operations committee, but the governance subcommittee as it is looking at the, um, the, the local service councils. And again, getting back to the trust and the partnership between RTD and local governments, it, it seems like that might be a nice connection to the work that's happening within the governance committee as well. Um, so I wanna just kind of bring that in as a, as a recommendation or at least a collaboration opportunity with our other subcommittee. Um, I also want to just open it up. Any question? Kristen? Yes, I see. And this is kind of a, a side note. Uh, Crystal, you were talking about uh, people that could not afford to either maintain or build sidewalks. I believe it's the city of Inglewood that actually puts money into the property tax rate that includes money for sidewalks. Um, which is interesting because 
people pay property tax and you know they add twelve dollars a month or forty dollars a year or whatever and that actually they use that as kind of like an insurance how insurance works is a hundred people pay twenty dollars and one person needs an eighty dollar prescription with all of the money that goes into these property taxes the city can take that money and use that to build sidewalks i believe it's singlewood okay i'll look into that thank you Kristen. can i add to Kristen's comment um the Denver Streets Partnership uh, has been uh, pressuring the city of Denver to do that. Um, again, uh, sometimes a, a sidewalk repair can be anywhere from you know five hundred to five thousand dollars, and we realize that that is a financial uh, burden on some property owners. Uh, but we look at the example that Inglewood does have, and we'll be pushing that this year for the city of Denver. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Elise, I see you have your hand up. Thanks. I guess this is less of a question and more of a comment that I'd like to get a reaction. It seems like everything on your list um, would also be beneficial to the public at large. They're just generically good, helpful things that would make the transit system work better for everybody. Um, you give a, an extra reason to prioritize this body of work to make sure that things are truly accessible, but they aren't things that would be um, detrimental or neutral to to the other riders, they would actually be beneficial. It, it would appear just from the the listening to you list those out. It, it, is that a correct statement? I, I agree with you, Elise. You know, I'm one of my uh, uh, I've always uh, stated that I've been doing this for like 20 years now, and I've always said that when there's an improvement. Um, to the disability community when it comes to access, it usually affects the general public uh, in a positive way. Uh, that's why I work with different groups like Mile High Connects and Denver Streets Partnership. You know, people say, why do you work with Denver Streets Partnership? They're mostly a bicycle uh, group. And I say, when you know, when we improve service for uh, people with bicycles and sidewalks, that really improves access for people with disabilities. So it really is a pendulum. Uh, when we improve service for people with disabilities, it's really good for everybody. Thank you, Jamie. So I also want to point out a couple of comments that are in the chat. So if folks want to take a, a glance over there. Um, Director Geisinger, I saw that your hand was raised. And you are on mute. Just a quick question on, on uh, uh, thanks for the presentation, Jamie, on the a uh, question of a uh, space for bikes and scooters and for three and four wheel bikes and scooters. Did you say that those those um, three and four wheels bikes and scooters are part of Denver's new uh, plan as it rolls out a new bike share program? Correct. It's in the RFP. It's uh, required by by the contractor. Correct. So what you what you're asking for from RTD would be space for a station. Is that uh, Correct. I, I think it really needs to be promoted. I think there needs to be a large space where, you know, it's not ambiguous. It's, you know exactly where to go for these uh, bikes, scooters, or other. Um, I think it's, it's it's a great connection. You know, I remember when Dave Genova, before he left, you know, he was pushing that idea that RTD is going to be the go-to. You know, you start your transportation. RTD may not end your trip, but it's gonna get you to there. So when you get off the train, instead of you having to walk a mile and a half to your to your job, now you can transfer to another modem, whether it be a taxi, Uber, bike, scooter, multimodal bike, you know, all those services should be at the stations. Good, thanks. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You're welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Well, thank you again uh, for joining us, Jamie. I would love, I know you provided the recommendations to the team um, or to the operations committee. So thank you again for providing those in written form. And again, as um, we continue our work, I wanna encourage CCDC and Denver Street's partnership to certainly provide their insight and input into this um, conversation. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to add before we shift to uh, the business perspective is that today's uh, presentation by CCDC was really just the first um, of what I, I anticipate as the second portion, um, which will be at our next meeting, where we really focus on 
um, not necessarily the fixed routes, but we start to look at the vehicles themselves and procurement processes and how we can apply um, an equity lens, really looking at how uh, the actual buses are serving or not serving folks experiencing disability and those that are in that are in our disabled community. So I want to just kind of prime that conversation, um, which will be coming up. Um, so thank you very much, Jamie, for joining us. Thank you, for everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. So I want to shift the committee um, to the second portion of the conversation, which is a continuing to focus on fixed route service, but from the business uh, community, um, or in this case, from the higher education community. So I've uh, asked Carl Meese, he's the director of campus planning at the Auraria Higher Education Campus, um, to join us and provide his perspective. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Carl. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate you uh, including me today. Um, you know, it's obviously, uh, I'm sure, as with all of you, it's been quite a busy start of the year. So I'm not sure if what I put together is is what you're looking for, but then we can just open up for open up for questions. And I'm happy to answer those. Um, so basically, the campus is served primarily at the exterior of the campus. We're surrounded by Auraria Parkway, Colfax, and Spear Boulevard. So we have great service from the 1, 15, 16 on those perimeter roads, um, those bus routes. And then of course the light rail at Colfax and light rail at the Auraria West station. So that is the bulk of our service. And then we do have two lines that enter the campus property, um, the six and the 43. And they actually, it's the end of their route and they dwell on campus until they start their new uh, circulation pattern. Um, what I would say is those lines replace the 15. Um, the 15 used to come into the center of campus, and that served our campus community a lot better than the, the 6 and 43. I think we see very low ridership on those buses, um, and so that's just something I've noticed recently. I think the line switched maybe four years ago, something like that. We've also had a lot of construction on campus, and it's all it's affected where this dwell zone can go and where it is today. It's currently on 11th Street near Auraria Parkway. So it's actually been pushed again to the edges of the campus. So we have great connection to the edges of campus and then the campus is pretty big, but it's not unwalkable. But I think for um, anyone with mobility issues or things like that, that could be a challenge of getting to their points within the campus. We also have the um, accessor ride service on campus which is also a big success. And I know that a lot of folks use that and it's a great way to not only get around campus, but um, more importantly, to get connected from the campus to some um, other routes and, and bus stops and, and uh, terminals. Um, we have heard from the students, um, those few that are still coming to campus, we're about 10% occupied right now with uh, COVID restrictions. So we are primarily remote learning um, and that is for students, faculty and staff. Uh, but what I have heard is that the cuts in service recently have impacted um, the folks that are still using transit to get to the campus. And that includes both um, reduction in lines and um, reduction in the number of buses frequenting the campus or, or uh, the timing. Um, also a big, big, um, probably the primary concern for the campus was the RTD pass for the students and the eco pass for our faculty and staff. Uh, in the past, we have had a all for one system, I guess you'd call it, where everyone pays and um, everyone gets a pass whether they use it or not. And that has worked, but it has not worked under COVID. And so we actually did not renew our agreement last year and the students did not get um, the passes this last year. I think we have entered a new um, agreement where we have an opt in system now so the students can uh, purchase their way into a, a reduced student pass, which I think is great and is working well for these, you know, strange times that we're in. Um, and then finally, I will mention that uh, the campus is undergoing several strategic planning processes. So um, let me kind of take a step back. AHEC, the agency I work for, is the fourth state agency on the campus. We manage the land, property, and shared services for the three higher education institutions that share the campus, uh, CU Denver, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and the Community College of Denver. 
that all share our campus proper. So I work for a fourth state agency that manages the shared services um, and the land. And um, both AHEC and CU Denver are undergoing strategic planning processes. Metro just completed theirs. CCD just got a new CEO and will be starting one soon. Part of this is we are interested in exploring um, with RTD and, and the community is exactly what should the service to the campus look like, what, sh what routes would be best if, if there's any opportunities for new routes or different routes to come to campus, um, and where those stops and terminuses should go on campus. So it's this is really kind of, um, you're, you're hearing the first of this. Uh, it's not really, um, we haven't worked, uh, reached out much with RTD because we have just started this process, but that's our goal is, is to kind of take a step back and do some big picture master plan um, type analysis and suggestions for future service to the campus. Thank you so much, Carl. I wanna go ahead and open it up for the committee if folks have questions, comments. I can actually kick us off. Oh, sorry. Oh, I sorry, Dan. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just um, I'm just uh, noticing um, that this is just from the Auraria campus. I'm assuming that we'll also have input from like the other campuses or universities um, impacted by uh, RTD as well. Yes. Yeah, so to kick us off for today, we just wanted to get at least one campus's perspective, but certainly want to open it up as well. Um, okay, I just I'm just trying to put my comments into perspective, um, uh, you know, as we like compare different where different universities are at as well. So thank you. Thank you. I guess to that point, Carl, I do have a question in terms of where your ridership is coming from. I know um, this is very much a commuter campus, commuter campus being all really all four of uh, the institutions that are on the Auraria campus. Can you give us a sense of where folks are traveling to and from? and how that might affect your campus planning initiative. For sure. So um, we have about 40,000 students that attend the campus. And um, they is correct. It's primarily a, a commuter campus. That's been our, um, that's been traditionally our, our main draw of students. However, we are starting to put on some uh, on-campus housing. We have our first housing project that'll be complete for fall 2021. Um, that'll have about 600 beds, so that's new and exciting. But we are primarily a commuter campus, and um, the the majority of the folks are coming from kind of the Capitol Hill, West Colfax um, areas. Uh, that's where, well, traditionally the cheaper rent has been, and not so much anymore. So I think actually we're starting to see folks come from even further out. Um, and we do see uh, students coming from the entire RTD region. Um, but I think primarily it's kind of gonna be those Colfax lines and the West line. Um, and then down South uh, is where most of our students are coming from. And I guess if I could ask the same question, but now looking at it from the perspective as an employer and as an anchor institution, where, where, does, your, where does the majority of your staff and employee base come from? Um, I believe it's the same. I think um, we, we uh, the staff and faculty actually probably it's more dispersed. Um, we're gonna we see folks from out, from all over the place, north, east, south, and west. And then um, really, we're seeing less and less people living really close to campus, and so that's where these um, on-campus housing projects have really sprung from and the, there's there's high demand for that. There's also been a market response. Um, so I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the CoLab housing that's on Colfax and Osage. That was not a campus project. It was a private development targeted at our students um, because the demand for affordable housing near the campus is so high. Good, thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? I just appreciate this uh, opportunity, and I know, um, you know, depending on where you go with this, we do have a student advisory committee to the Auraria Board of Directors, and um, those students would be happy to chat with you. I know they have the ears 
of, or the they're kind of hear from all the students and represent them. So they might have a better insight into some of these uh, service needs uh, questions you might be exploring. Great, thank you so much, Carl. Um, before you hop off, I guess I do have another question related to the RTD Pass program. You mentioned that for the students, um, it's gonna be an opt-in. Is that the same for your staff or can you talk a little bit about what that looks like for the employee base? Yes, so um, it just happened. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know all the details, but I do know that for faculty and staff, they also have an opt-in um, way of purchasing a pass. I believe it's basically an unlimited pass that you purchase and um, you pay for it for the entire semester. And if you buy today, the cost is X amount, but if you bought in two months, it would be a reduced amount because you're only getting those last few months. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. It's something we've never had before. And I think it might just be a different way of offering the pass, but we'll see how well it works for both the campus and RTD. Um, to probably see that you unmuted yourself. I don't, I'm not sure if you had anything else to add to that. Yes, hi, thank you so much, Deborah Johnson. I wanna thank Carl. Uh, this was an effort in which we came together and had a discussion about what could be. And um, we're anxious to see how we go forward. We're going to be tracking the usage of said passes because quite naturally we would like to uh, see this become permanent and considering what lies ahead, we wanted to ensure that we were giving people the opportunity to use it for discretionary trips as well, as we talk about growing ridership. So the opt-in um, the opt-in option basically gives people a greater ability to discern what they need to do if they're matriculating on campus, if they're not. And so basically, as we go forward, this is just a prime example how we're willing to be more flexible and agile. So it's a cooperative effort, and this is just an example of what we could do going forward once we garner appropriate feedback, and there could be tweaks along the way, recognizing that we do have to do a fair equity analysis um, before we could continue on. But I just wanted to share that we're really excited about, uh, about this program. So thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that. I, I know it's um, you've been a great partner to work with. So um, thank you there too. And uh, just a final comment for everybody is we do have a sustainable campus program and it's a student fee and student led and um, very keen on reducing single occupancy vehicle trips to the campus. Uh, we do have about uh, 6,000 parking spaces on campus. It's a goal of ours to never add a new parking space. We will transition from surface lots to structured parking as we develop the campus, but we don't, we don't wanna add more parking capacity. We wanna um, use alternative transportation as the way to increase um, the, the number of people coming to campus. I'm curious, Carl, kind of on that note, what are you seeing or hearing as the biggest challenge to getting folks out of their vehicles and into um, public transit to help you meet that goal? It's um, it's a tough one. We did a survey recently and it's quite surprising, but I think a lot of our students are non-traditional. So they're not, you know, um, where living on campus and, and the college experience is their 24 seven experience. Um, a lot of folks have uh, jobs and families. And so really they're driving because they're combining trips, um, doing the trip combining. They're picking up uh, kids after daycare, after their classes. Um, and then, so I, I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, we also, although we hear <laughs> nonstop about how expensive our parking is, our parking is very cheap um, compared to the surrounding area. So I think um, with that, it's still quite affordable for the students to park every day um, at our current rates. And then um, unfortunately, a lot of our buildings are showing their age and we don't have a lot of high quality hang out and dwell spaces for the students, they actually end up spending um, breaks in their car. So they will take their lunch in their car um, rather than find a space on campus. We're working on that nonstop to improve our spaces so that we can get them out of their cars and back contributing to the activity of the campus. And it's a tough one. Thank you, Carl. Having um, attended a commuter school myself many years ago, I. I understand. Yes, if I could have <laughs> ridden public transit, I would have done it in a heartbeat. So mm -hmm. thank you so much.
Of course, um, yes, thank you. All right. Well, once again, thank you, um, Carl and then Jamie, for both joining us and providing this overview to the um, operations subcommittee. Again, the purpose of today was really just to kind of ground us in terms of um, what the experience looks like for both the disability community and the business perspective, including university from the student and as an employer in our region, um, and how those two audiences are really experiencing um, the RTD, uh, RTD services. So. Um, as I mentioned before, the next conversation is going to dive deeper into that and really looking at it from a workforce perspective. Um, but I do want to lift up Crystal's comment in, in terms of getting additional um, insight from universities and, and other employers. And I just want to um, maybe suggest as a uh, next step or at least as an action item for this group, um, it may be worth it to convene uh some of these these institutions outside of the committee meeting and make that an optional kind of work group listening session um, i want to just check in with members of the committee to see if that would be of interest for folks and i'm thinking um again just lifting up the the other institutions like cu boulder uh, potentially regis university du i'm seeing a couple of head nods thumbs up okay so matthew you and i can can work on that and see what what our schedules look like and how we might be able to convene just like this work group session. All right. We have a couple minutes left. I just want to do a quick check in. Do folks, members of the committee have any questions, comments or other matters that we'd like to bring up at this time? Yes, Elise. Um, one uh, issue that came up that um, I just wanted to uh, encourage people. I don't know that this subcommittee is engaged in it too much, but some of the other subcommittees have of having conversations um, via email with subcommittee members. Um, it's not very transparent to the public. So just a reminder to folks to um, bring your discussions to these meetings so that the public can hear what we're talking about. So thanks um, in advance for everybody remembering to do that. Um, I also wanted to um, just check in in terms of where we are with this subcommittee in terms of trying to map out, calendar out the different sort of recommendation areas that you're, you're wanting to touch on before um, our final report time and just check in on where we are in that process. Matthew, I see you've unmuted yourself. I was just going to suggest that uh, the, um, the the chairwoman of this committee and I have a meeting uh, tomorrow to uh, to further plan uh, the the next several meetings for the subcommittee, and we will be uh, putting together a table uh, just like the other two subcommittees have put together, so we can have that di discussion at the next meeting. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. For lifting that up. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. You all have an extra five minutes back of your day. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dea. Thanks, everyone.